By now, we all have seen AI-generated images of faces, cars. We're also quite familiar with language translation, I mean from English to French or English to Spanish, etc. But can we translate programming languages? Yes, I mean, can we translate C++ to Python or Python to Java or Java to C++? Traditionally, transcompilers are well known for this problem of translating from one high-level language to another. They are rule-based systems where you define what syntax needs to be replaced by what. While AI systems are so good at translating spoken languages, can we use AI for transcompiling? It will be even better if we can do it in an unsupervised way. This paper from Facebook AI proposes just that. Just to give you an example, the model proposed in this paper takes as input the Python code on the left and outputs the C++ code on the right. Let's jump straight in and learn how they do it. Just imagine how many language a good novel or a book is translated into. With this abundance of parallel data between languages, developing AI systems for translating between languages becomes fairly easy as we can leverage supervised learning for this problem. When it comes to source code or programs, there is simply not that much parallel data available for any two given languages. And this has been a huge challenge in developing AI-based transcompilers. But what we do have are plenty of open source projects. This work makes the most of these open source projects and shows that we can train in an unsupervised manner and achieve results that are better than rule-based transcompilers. The paper proposes a fully unsupervised training approach to translate between programming languages. As we will see from the results, such an AI-based system surpasses the rule-based transcompilers, thereby promising a big future in this direction. The authors also collated a test set of 852 parallel functions in C++, Java and Python and validate the correctness of the proposed model by running several unit tests on the proposed model and on the traditional approaches. Let's look at the unsupervised training approach. The paper uses a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, which is nothing but an encoder and a decoder architecture. While most modern NLP systems now use an encoder and a decoder, the novelty of this work comes from the three training steps that they follow. So what are the steps then? The first one is the cross-lingual masked language model pre-training and the next one is denoising autoencoding for fine-tuning the decoder further and the last step is back translation which has become a very successful approach for unsupervised tasks. Now let's look at each of these steps. Pre-training is a key step in unsupervised learning. You mask some random tokens like if and int in this case and then ask the model to guess what comes there. You may now ask how can this be effective in translation as we show the same language both in the input and the output. The cross-lingual ability comes from the huge overlap of common tokens between languages. For example, keywords like if, while, try are present in all three languages like C++, Java and Python. Maybe it will help us understand better if we look at them in terms of embeddings. Let's say this is the TSND visualization of different embeddings from the encoder. Before the training, similar words in both languages lie far apart, meaning that the model does not know that they are closely related. However, after training, the encoder maps similar words closer together. Now what makes this so effective is the anchor points or anchor words like for, if and while which are the same across languages say C++ and Python. So the more these anchor points or words the supervised or the unsupervised pre-training will be quite effective. The next stage is denoising autoencoding. At this stage 
we not only mask the inputs but to make it more difficult to the, to the model, we also remove and shuffle some tokens. This strengthens the pre-trained encoder-decoder architecture to provide even better representations of the input. But the model still lacks the ability to translate between languages as we have never told the model which input belongs to which language. We simply add extra layers to the decoder and initialize them randomly. We add a token to say that the input language is Python or C++ so that the model can start differentiating between languages. The third and last stage is back translation. So far, the model has always seen the same language in the output and the input. To strengthen its ability to translate, we follow a classic component of unsupervised machine translation, which is back translation. Here, you first take a source language and translate it to a target language. In this case, from Python to C++. Then you use another model to translate from C++ back to Python. Now, this output will be noisy. By noisy, I mean the output may not be right 100% of the times. But that's okay. You still use this noisy output to train model 1 to generate the source language. This is weakly supervised as we don't have the correct mapping from input to the output. But it's the best you can get using our models and training this way still works. For training data, they use Google's BigQuery. They only keep C++, Python and Java files and discard the rest. For the first step, which is pre-training, they use all the available code and for the second and third steps, they just use functions from the code. This kind of makes sense because the test set consists of just functions and some unit tests to evolve the, evaluate the results. Let's also not forget that they use standard tokenizers that come with these languages for pre-processing and removing unnecessary spaces and tabs. So a tokenized code for Python looks like this. Now we managed to train our algorithm without any parallel code. But to evaluate the transcoder, we do need some parallel code. For this, they use the geeks for geeks platform and curate a test set with parallel functions in C++, Java and Python. Traditionally, blue is a score used to compare language translation systems. When it comes to programming languages, a small change in the program can have a significant impact on the output. For example, imagine minus being replaced by a plus in this code. The output of the program will be quite different. So blue is not a great metric. So they introduce a metric called computational accuracy. As the name suggests, they literally compare the outputs of the translated functions by running several unit tests. With that note on evaluation metrics, let's take a look at the results. They of course report the results in blue score and computational accuracy that we just saw. Interestingly, the performance is far better when we translate from seemingly similar languages like C++ and Java. But the moment we translate from totally different languages like C++ to Python or Python to Java, both the computational accuracy and the blue score significantly reduce, indicating that there's a lot of room for improvement here. Let's recollect the anchor points that we discussed earlier. There are a lot of anchor points or common keywords between C++ and Java, and I think that's played a major role for better performance between these two languages. Also, even as humans, we find moving from C++ to Java very easy compared to moving from C++ to Python. So, will machines overtake humans in programming? Let's wait and watch. We don't know yet. But what we do know is that machines produce very accurate statistics and clearly there are many more unsubscribed viewers than subscribe viewers. So if you're watching, please subscribe and it will encourage me to create more videos like this in the future. Thank you very much and I'll see you next week. Bye.